Good evening, folks. Welcome back. I am Ross Weaver, doing my Metal Gear Solid V Explained Lecture Series once again. Uh, this will be lecture number 18, where we cover missions 37, 38, and 39, uh, Traitor's Caravan Extreme, Extraordinary, and Over the Fence Total Stealth. Now, what we're going to have to talk about today, tonight, is uh, symbolism, really. We're, we're going to just... I've been talking about how all this stuff in the game up to this point has been symbolic sort of recreations of, of the past and how there's symbolism being used in these characters and I haven't really delved into a proper discussion too much about symbolism itself and how symbolic interpretation is done and the traditions of that and so on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today uh, <clears throat> and we're going to you know, tie in some of the skull face stuff a little bit too with why he's like Jesus and I know that may have sounded kind of weird. Uh, and that was a couple of lectures ago, but we're just, it's going to come back up because, like I've said, we're, we kind of are the guy we've just been playing as in the first half of the game, kind of is Skullface now. And so it's like we've be kind of become Skullface if we understood his speech properly. And so that provides a little more context as to why all the stuff's happening again and so on and so forth. So, with that said, let's get into mission 37. Now, Trader's Caravan, again, we're going out. And picking up another <clears throat> truck that's full of this weaponized parasite in the back. And like I've said, it's probably relating more to Oilix this time around for, for Solidus. But since they would probably need the parasite research to get to Oilix to begin with, there would probably be this path that they would take to just discover what, you know, Solidus probably wasn't let in on what the parasites were and all that stuff after he was born. And he probably had to kind of figure it out through all of this stuff that he went through. Excuse me. So, all this nuclear weapons technology and nuclear weapons enrichment and the nuclear stuff, like I've kind of said before, is really just a a way of speaking of the this this parasite power since they operate on the quantum level and they operate to manipulate the atomic level. It's kind of nuclear, but there's another way of seeing the nukes themselves as just kind of a symbol for new technologies. Um, and it comes from the, the, the transformational power of the parasites. So it's like, you know, when a, when a new technology is developed, it's kind of an Armageddon in some ways for the old, you know, parts of the industry that ran off of the older versions of the technology sometimes. And, uh, you know, in a way that, that you could consider that like a, a nuclear shift. Um, in the way that, like, you know, when, when a, an atom undergoes some kind of a, a process to morph into, say, a, another atom or another element. Uh, there's kind of usually some kind of, you know, you could call it like apocalyptic Armageddon type thing, you know, fission or fusion or something like that. A lot of energy is released, right? And so I think that's why nuclear stuff is kind of appropriated as the symbolic vehicle in, in Metal Gear Solid V for speaking of just new technologies in general and, and new developments also kind of, you could say, in the... Uh, in the whole drama of Metal Gear. Uh, but we'll get back into symbolism here in a little bit more. Uh, but first, we, we kind of also have to talk about what's going on here. So, we've been doing up to this point, there was a Footprints of Phantoms in the previous mission that's in Africa, and Cursed Legacy was off in Africa. But before Footprints of Phantoms, we were in Afghanistan still, and I was saying that was kind of Solidus's whole... Uh, Re his whole rebellion and his whole, you know, reigniting all of the conflict stuff. And so, you know, we kind of have this question of why is Solidus rebelling? And I think it's because this parasite research is still going on. It's just probably labeled nanomachine stuff or something different back then. But he knows that Cypher's still kind of uh, messing with this stuff. And maybe he knew some of the, the previous drama that it had caused with all Big Boss, you know, in his fall in 84. And with all that stuff being redacted, you could think of his words in, in Metal Gear Solid 2 about how he's against the Patriots for covering up history and things like that. And that may be kind of part of his motivations here, too. So in kind of a way, since a lot of what he's doing is a direct result of Cypher's reaction, it's kind of his reaction to Cypher's reaction to Big Boss's mutiny. And so in a way, he's kind of Big Boss's ghost his his sort of chain of this chain of revenge that Skullface speaks of kind of shows its head here 
and shows how Solidus' actions are kind of, you, you would say, sort of guided by his reaction to what he sees Cypher doing, which they were doing probably for good reasons, but he didn't see all the stuff that came before that. He didn't see the reaction of Cypher as a reaction. He just kind of saw it as an action, and then he has his own reaction to that. So that's, you know, again, it's, it's a nuclear fission, you know, kind of chain reaction thing going on. And uh, I think this all ties in with Eli as well. And how, you know, Eli kind of sees all of this stuff going on and has all of his, you know, internalized, you know, feelings that he's got about it. And, and you know, he's, he's a little mad. Uh, and you can kind of relate to that, I think. You know, it's kind of like uh, whenever you see a story that's played out in front of you and you don't fully understand, like you just don't get it the first time because they, they're using symbols maybe or it's just, you know, it's kind of tough to follow or maybe it's... Um, you know, purposefully written in a way to not make it easy to follow. Um, in any of those cases, though, it's like when, when you're done watching that, listening to that, or enjoying that, whatever experience it was the first time, you, you're you going to kind of have this, like, moment of, like, well, wait, did I really get it all? You know, you're going to feel like maybe it was bad in some way, or maybe that, uh, you know, because it didn't explain itself fully to you, it's like, well, you know... I. I don't get it, right? <laughs> and so how are you supposed to get it? Well, this is a problem in religions, too. You know, like... Well, we'll get into it more with, with the symbolism stuff, but uh, learning how to interpret symbolism, you know, and, and just learning how to see it and stuff like that is kind of important to not just understanding this game, but probably to, like, you know, it's, it's useful in a lot of daily life stuff, too. Uh, but also in, like, a lot of, like, higher order life. Uh, ways of kind of structuring your life, um, you know, around principles and, you know, why you do what you do every day and things like that. So that, you know, circles back into, you know, Solidus and Eli and why they're so kind of inherently rebellious, I think. There's there's kind of this, uh, like I said, the dilution of the legacy going on, but also they're kind of taking a guy who's literally a copy of Naked Snake and putting him through kind of the same, you know, a, a recreation of Big Boss's own actions, but kind of putting him on the other side of things, you know, so that he can see the other side of the equation. And then, of course, we know he doesn't like that, so he rebels anyways, which is probably expected. It might even be part of the plan, you know? Um, given that, you know, Solidus is a clone, and he's completely controlled by Cypher in the first years of his life, they probably could have programmed him to do just about anything they wanted to. Um, but like I said, since he's a clone of the real the original Naked Snake, he's probably more put out there for, you know, reasons of, of dealing with the legacy, and, and uh, you know, we, we get to it later how, in Metal Gear Solid 4, the genetics of Big Boss itself is kind of important, and it gives him his his specific access to the network, essentially, to the AI network, and uh, it's like a network key, his genetics are. And so that's why they're able to use Solidus in the way they do in Metal Gear Solid 4 as kind of a replacement for the original Big Boss. But we know he's he's actually uh, a clone of Naked Snake, and Eli is also a clone of Naked Snake, and that's why Eli doesn't match Venom genetically, as Venom is not technically a clone of Naked Snake. He's got the same parasite genetic stuff kind of going on, but he's really more of his own man, and that's why their genetics don't match up. So and that's why I say, in a way, Solidus is Eli would have been Jack, but also, in a way, that doesn't make sense, because their genetics do match up, and we know the story of Eli is his genetics don't match his father's, so, you know, maybe that's like a, a recontextualization deal, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe in his version of things, you know, they didn't do a DNA test, they used some other way of proving that they're not uh, genetically, you know, father and son, which, you know, technically they're not, and they'd, they'd be more like, more akin to brothers, you know, if anything, uh, but anyways. So I also want to talk about, since this is Trader's Caravan, you're facing the Skull Soldiers. Uh, the Skulls are kind of, in my mind, I think of them as Null Soldiers. Um, the Skulls themselves are kind of, you know, they're, they're blank slates. And if you look at what they're wearing, their, their outfit, and compare it to Venom's Parasite suit as well, there's kind of a... <clears throat> What would you call it a uh, a loss of identity effect that happens from 
all the grayness and the, and the sort of the supernatural kind of qualities of it and the, the zombie-esque kind of nature of it all. It kind of, it's, it's dehumanizing, sure, but they still have human forms. And so it's like, they're, they're, they're not necessarily inhuman or like not human, I should say. They're more inhuman and in that they're, they're kind of like these blank slates, right? That just kind of, their identity doesn't seem really important, right? And so in that way, they're kind of like a null empty set or a, a blank slate. They're just some soldier, you know, it, and that goes back to how I think that the original Roy Campbell was Cos Miller. And when he was killed, he was replaced with essentially just a, a shell. And I think that's also kind of a commentary on like a corporate culture, and especially like CEO culture and how the sort of the whole executive rigmarole in, in the corporate capitalist kind of run world is really just a series of revolving doors of just the replacements of just yes men and the same guys in suits being all the same and all that kind of stuff. So these skulls are kind of like, almost like conformity in a way, too, because they're all four alike. And uh, and again, that reinforces they're this blank slate. Even though they maybe have small differences in how they look in some ways, they're all pretty much depicted as, you know, uh, you know, kind of a, they're, they're a little, uh, a little group thinky little, little cluster. Uh, and they do all, you know, they operate as a group, you know, they're, they're explicitly not individuals. And so I think all that kind of plays into, you know, all this, uh, all these themes that you know, Big Boss wanted, the original Big Boss wanted a a super soldier drone that was you know somebody that didn't have an identity that he could just control that he could send out on the battlefields to do his will. And this all kind of relates to symbolism and how um, there's this idea that you now now I've stolen this directly from Joseph Campbell and I I done a lot of reading from Joseph Campbell and I'm going to talk about him for a little bit here. Uh, Campbell was a author and teacher in comparative mythology back in, oh, I want to say like he started in the 40s. So old school, a whole nother generation. And I started reading his stuff back in college and it was kind of how I learned symbolic interpretation, how I learned to do all this stuff essentially. I got interested in it after Matrix Reloaded came out, and I loved the movie, but I was like, what the heck is all this symbolism stuff going on? Read some stuff online, got pointed to Joseph Campbell, started reading it, and I was like, hey, this makes sense. I was you know, raised raised in a Methodist Christian church, and I'll get to it, but the way you're raised in the church doesn't necessarily lend itself to understanding symbolism. Uh, it, it more is about understanding like history and... So this relates to, you can kind of interpret a symbol in two ways, right? You can interpret it literally as like a historical reference, or you can interpret it symbolically as like a sort of decoupled from reality thing. It's it's more of a uh, an internal symbol. A symbol is, you know, it's more of an internal thing. It's, uh, you know, like a word. It's, a, it's, it's not just a reference, though. Um, a signpost is kind of what a reference is. It just points you to the next thing. A symbol is more of a, it's a transcendent deal, and it kind of speaks directly to you. Um, now, you can't really prove that any symbols are transcendent. This is just an idea. But it's a way of thinking of symbols in two different ways, as a signpost is like something that you see on a sign on the side of the road, and a symbol would be more like the cross that you see on top of a church. Um, symbols are supposed to be understood to be you know, more than just a historical reference, essentially. So it's it's not just a reference to a specific event or a specific first time that this thing popped up. It's supposed to be understood to be part of a longer tradition that really pre that is antecedent, really. I guess you would say to uh to history itself and to existence, our existence. You know, symbols. A good symbol is kind of it's an eternal idea. It has nothing to do with the time in which it arises. Um, or really, you know, anything to do with reality, like I said. It's it's kind of its own thing. So, um, this is a book I'm going to read from a little bit. It's called The Mythic Dimension. It's a bunch of selected essays by Campbell. If you want to read Campbell yourself, also a couple of the other books I have that I like. One of them is called The Power of Myth here. The other one's called Thou Art That, or Tatvamasi. And uh, those are good, like, kind of introductions to understanding 
interpreting symbolism and, sim- and seeing symbolism in art and things like that. But I want to read this little passage that he's talking about in his essay about the interpretation of symbolic forms. And now, I don't believe everything Campbell says, but this is just what he says. Uh, I think since, like I said, Campbell's from a different generation, you kind of have to take the context of this guy lived through World War II and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, he kind of comes from a different time, but I think a lot of what he says kind of holds true. So um, he's talking about here, you know, specifically Christianity and the cross and how all of this stuff, you know, the, the cross itself is kind of understood to be if you go and ask like a pastor, you know, what's the what's the cross mean? Well, they're going to tell you it's a reference to a historical event, the crucifixion of Christ, which happened, you know, back in around 30 AD or something like that. You know, it's it's a whole um in, in Sunday school in my Methodist church when you brought up, you know, you're not really taught all of the the this the themes of the Bible necessarily as just the only thing to understand, you're taught the his, the history of the Bible as is, as if it's a real history of real events that happened, and you know, guys, it, it's not real. There's like talking snakes, and you know, people who are living f- for hundreds of years. It's all meant to be understood symbolically, and so let me let me just pick up with, with this paragraph. It's kind of a longer one, but this is what Campbell says: uh, "Quote." The crucial point of my argument is that the imagery of religions, whether of the high religions or of the simpler, non-literate, primitive forms, is gravely misinterpreted, or rather is interpreted misleadingly when it, was, when it is understood to apply primarily to historical events. Such a mythologem, for example, as the virgin birth. Was that a historical event? If so, it presents a biological medical problem, far indeed from anything that might, be proper, that might properly be regarded as of spiritual interest. It cannot have referred originally to any specific historical event, because we find it in mythologies throughout the world. It is a prominent motif in the mythologies of mankind, and many examples antedate by millennia that of the Christian legend. The symbology of religion is, in many of its most essential elements, common to the whole of the human race, so that no matter what religion to what religion you may turn, you will, if you look long enough, find a precise and often illuminating counterpart to whatever motif of your own tradition you may wish to have explained. Consequently, the reference of these symbols must be to something that is antecedent to any historical events to which they may have become locally applied. Mythological symbols come from the psyche and speak to the psyche. They do not spring from or refer to historical events. They are not to be read as newspaper reports of things that once upon a time actually happened. So what he's talking about there is how... Let's let's just take an example. The symbol of the mother. Now, we all have a mother. We're all born from a mom. And so you could say the symbol of mother refers to... when you. When I say the word mom, you're probably thinking of your mother or a specific mother as a way of understanding the reference there, the connection that your brain makes, right? But the idea of mother has nothing to do with any one individual mother and is really more about the idea of mother and is really antecedent to humans because we know, you know, mothers didn't really start with humans. So because there's other animals and you know life is just a big long process that goes way back and we don't really know where the beginnings of it are so it's it's better to understand these things he says as as symbolic forms that don't necessarily have anything to do with historicity you're not supposed to be like oh this is this happened back in in history and stuff like that and think of it that way because that kind of pulls all the spirituality out of it if if you're just viewing it as a history well it's dead there's, there's no room for interpretation, actually. And that's that kind of relates back to what's going on here in Metal Gear and why there's so much symbolism used. Now, I also want to mention when he talks about how the virgin birth, you know, shows up in a lot of other um, mythologies that are, you know, predating Christianity. So does the cross and Christ's crucifixion. Um, over in uh, Central America. The Quetzal is kind of a symbol for the same thing that Christ stands for. Uh, there's a cross and all the same kind of stuff. I, mean, I can't. I'm, I'm blanking on it right now, but 
I think the Quetzal, you know, coming up in Peace Walker and, and being local to that region is kind of a, an obvious hint to me. Um, the hill on which Christ was crucified, we know, is called Golgotha in Aramaic, and it's called Cavalry in Latin. You know what those two words mean? It means skull. So skull face is a reference to the hill upon which Christ is crucified. And so you see, that's why I, I was talking about it all as being, it's, it's all kind of a crucifixion reference. And uh, it's, it's, you know, like it's a sacrifice. And the Quetzal bird is also kind of depicted in, in some ways as having this skull at its feet, as if the, there's this same kind of production of the, the tree, the cross is kind of a tree, the Quetzal bird is up in the tree, and there's this skull at the bottom. And, you know, it's, it's, go look up the, uh, I think it's Mayan mythology that involves the Quetzal, and you'll find all kinds of parallels there. And Campbell talks about it a lot, and I'm, I'm forgetting it now, uh, but we need to move on because it's not really too important to the rest of this discussion. Um, but anyways, that's, again, that's why the nuclear stuff is still going on, and Solidus is mad about it. And uh, he's out, you know, causing all this ruckus. And so he he was in Afghanistan, sort of me metaphorically establishing his own base. And now he's out here in Africa, sort of invading our base now. So we're off in the other parts of the jungle where Cursed Legacy happened. And then Footprints of Phantoms and Trader's Caravan are happening more in the central parts of Africa. And that's where Solidus is running around. And we're, we're about to come to a head with him, essentially. And... In the timeline, this is mentioned as being the first Congo War and the second Congo War happening, I believe, in like 96 to 98. Um, so I suspect some of these missions probably take take place between 1996 and 1998. Maybe some of them take place in 97. Maybe they skip 97. But I kind of think of uh, Trader's Caravan Solidus' version happening in probably late 96, maybe early 97. So that's you can put that as a kind of waypoint in your head. And so mission 38, let's get onto that one, is extraordinary. So if Solidus is out in Africa and he's on the trail of all of the our parasite research that we've inherited now, well, we gotta clean up our mess. We gotta cover up what's going on. So that's what extraordinary is about. We've got one of our agents is out in the field and now we're back in Afghanistan, kind of metaphorically back at our base, sort of, or maybe elsewhere, but uh, maybe it you know, has more to do with the Iraq stuff happening back in the 80s. Uh, but if this is really in, like I said, 97, eh, maybe this is more relating to what happened back in the 80s afterwards, um, in, the, in, the, you know, in the start of the cover-up for, uh, for Frank and all the stuff that he did. Uh, but I also think that some of this stuff really relates back to what happened in 1979. It really seems more like maybe, so the way this this intel, or I'm sorry, the uh, the briefing tape is presented to you, also it's telling you that he had his own man out investigating the extraordinaries from uh, uh, Dekelia, essentially Psycho Mantis and the Man on Fire, Tretage and the Man on Fire. And, uh, you know, this is sort of our way of seeing we're investigating all of this parasite stuff and we want to find out what's going on ourselves. And so this is kind of like the mission where it seems like, yeah, so does the rest of Diamond Dogs. <laughs> but also, it's really, we're trying to cover it up, actually. And so that's why we're going out and retrieving this intel, this little film canister, before anybody can get it. Now, again, the film canister should relate back to what I've been saying with the Philosopher's Legacy. And it was on a microfilm, right? So this... This film probably has more like parasite-related research on it, essentially. And we've got to go pick it up before the other side gets to it. And the other side is probably Solidus's men. And you know, we're we're on the other side. We're on our side now. <clears throat> so like, since this isn't, you know, an, an extreme or a modified mission, this is probably again, this is probably a, a young fox. So we're we're kind of playing a skull face here now. Excuse me. I want to mention there's this type of, of, you could say, laundering your own actions or covering up your own actions. Uh, it's referred to as the one hand washes the other scheme, where you have two sides that are working together in secret but appear to be you know, 
conflicting or you know in competition and you'll have one side do something dirty or nasty or whatever and then the other side will come in and do something else to cover that up and since it's not technically a self cover up and some other side did it you kind of have this way of of uh you know sort of la- like I said laundering the the real reasons why you did why this thing is happening or something like that and, and I don't know if that's a real general way of talking about it, but essentially it's like we've been going after all this parasite stuff because we were like, oh, this was the bad guy stuff, and now we're doing all the parasite stuff because you kind of need to develop the parasite yourself to do some of these harder missions like the extreme uh, metallic archaea, which comes up, the extreme cloaked and silence. They're all made a lot easier with parasite armor, uh, especially the extreme uh, version of Code Talker. Like If you try to do those without parasite armor, you're going to have a really bad time. <laughs> and so the, in the way the game pushes you towards this parasite stuff, uh, I think it's kind of like implying that now you're the one who's inherited all of this research and that is the philosopher's legacy. But then other people are viewing it as bad and they're chasing after it. So, I want to mention that Ocelot it says in the briefing tape all of this uh, informant's actions, his intel agent's actions, caught the attention of the KGB's director at S, and they got to him and silenced him, and that's why we have to go pick up his little dead drop that he left. Well, director at S, and I'll get back to it in uh, Mission 41 even more, but just think about the letter S and how it looks, and compare it to the number 5. S and 5 kind of look a lot alike. So... Think of Directorate S as kind of a a five squad, okay? I'll get back to that later, but just put a pin in that in your mind. Directorate S5, think of that. So like I said earlier, I also think this this mission's probably taking place in 97 primarily, and it's referencing maybe events that happened in 79 while Big Boss was af- you know, after the whole uh, Rhodesia episode and he was somewhere else. When Frank and Zero were trying to hunt him down and trying to track him down, maybe this was the version of the event where they finally got some intel on where Big Boss was operating, and we have to go pick it up. But his, you know, the intel agent was tracked down and killed, and we just have to go find the info that he's got for us. It's kind of like another intel agent rescue mission, except just with no intel agent. Um, I also want to mention that. Oh, and also that uh, this could have maybe also taken place in, like, 87, maybe? Like, while we were operating in... Well, I guess if it was in 87, we also would have been in Afghanistan. Uh, But maybe if you consider that Afghanistan could also be Iraq, and Afghanistan could be multiple places, you know? Uh, It's possible that while Young Fox was off doing what we were doing at the beginning of the the Afghanistan campaign. Old Fox was off securing some of this intel and stuff like that and 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 cleaning up his own tracks before we go out and do all of our stuff. Anyways. Now Spookmate keep stands for the quarantine platform. It's metaphorically kind of in the same position just 180 degrees. It's north to south and yeah. So the big event we know that takes place on the quarantine platform is, is Mission 43, Shining Lights Even in Death, which we haven't talked about yet, but this is, this. if you know the, if you know the mission, I'll talk about it more when we get there, there's a guy who's inside the quarantine platform who's kind of like our informant, who's, when, when this mutation and outbreak happens, he's sending intel, uh, he's sending communications from inside the, uh, the quarantine platform, and we gotta go find him. It seems like he might have some answer to you know what's going on, and that's kind of similar, I think, to this intel agent who's been killed. Uh, before we get to really contact him here in Extraordinary, but we still get his intel, um, and that relates to you know I think to you know figuring out the source of what was going on in Mission Forty Three and all of that, uh, all of that mission's narrative and stuff like that. But we'll get to it more when we get there. I also want to say that this hidden you know film canister around Spook May Keep. It's kept in a different spot every time you restart this mission. Or, I'm sorry, every time you start it from the beginning. 
if you restart it from within the mission, it'll respawn in the same spot. Um, so that's a good trick if you need to figure out how to S rank it. Just run in there, figure out where it is, and then just hit escape and restart the mission. And then it'll be in the same spot, as long as you don't go back to the ACC. But that's a good way to figure out how to get it and get it up quickly. But also, this kind of relates to a, a hidden diamond that we found back in Mission 1. It was in kind of an obvious spot, but the hidden diamond being at the top of the, the crack that you climb, and that we're calling Ground Zero's cliff climb, and the diamond being a self-reference, okay, this is all probably, you know, we're cleaning up after ourselves, essentially. It's, it's all kind of related to, um, you know, the parasite being the diamond being the thing that is really Big Boss's DNA, and that is sort of the, the, the source or the root of all of this mystery. And to further confirm that, once you've picked it up, completed your objective in this mission, and extraordinary, if you look at the map, the hot zone is in the shape of a diamond. And they do this in a couple of other spots in another in a few ways. Even the the uh, the mission area's boundaries in some missions are in the shape of a diamond, or in an uncut diamond, or in a halfway cut diamond. And you can go back and see all this stuff. And these are all missions that relate again to to the self identity and to you know the origin of diamond dogs. And we'll get into more of the symbolism of the diamond in mission forty three as well. Um, but there's a very good reason that, you know, the hidden diamond and the self-reference and diamond dogs has all been kind of built step by step through all these missions. If you've been paying attention, it's it's pretty easy to not see it, though. Okay, so that's enough for mission 38. Let's move on to 39. That is over the fence, total stealth. Now, this is also probably happening in 97. This is like our second Congo War stuff. It may be happening in 98, and everything here is kind of squeezed into 98, but I'm kind of thinking of it more spread out a little bit. Um, if if Afghanistan is sort of, you know, our base now, and Africa is kind of our base too, but Solidus is probably more, you know, uh, invading our base, essentially, is what's going on again. And so he's, he's stealing our stuff, um, doing what we have done. And doing what Frank did in the past, and so on and so, and what Big Boss probably did, and so on and so forth. So, um, this is, I think, really when Solidus secures Doctor Madnar. Um, we know Doctor Madnar is the guy who's behind all the Oilix stuff, and is behind a lot of the the sort of hijinks going on in Metal Gear Two. And he's kind of a sick and twisted dude. He's 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 pretty screwed up, and so that's why I I really peg this guy as Sokolov, like. Madnar Sokolov, he, you know, he's been doing some pretty inhuman stuff to people. Um, now, you know, Madnar, he does more of like the, I think it's it's more like external based. You know, he does like the, the armor stuff and, and all that kind of research. Um, you know, he's not really the one who knows all the Oilix stuff, but he's, I, I, it's uh, Dr. Keo Marv is really the one who they pull in and kind of, Madnar is the one who manipulates Marv. And so that's why I'm thinking Marv might be more of a, 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 way, a symbolic way of speaking a paramedic, possibly. And I haven't been talking about her a whole lot, but really her name, it's Strangelove at this point. Um, but also, speaking of 1979, we know that in the, in the timeline, and I'm, I don't think this is wrong, it's said that Frank Hunter killed Naomi Hunter's parents in Africa, in Rhodesia at the end of 79. Well, put together what all I've been saying here, well, 79 would have been, yeah, the end of the Rhodesia campaign. So during sort of that time period when the Code Talker mission, what I was saying, when that happened, when we pick up, who's probably zero, this is, it also, he's kind of, Code Talker's also, like I said, kind of a stand-in for Naomi Hunter, but also for paramedic, really for Strange Love and for Sokolov. Really, at that point, he was probably still Huey Emmerich. Um, so that would have required if they're if they're picked up. Maybe they even got maybe they got killed um, when they were picked up. Maybe there was something there that happened. Um, you know, it's it's unclear as to what exactly is going on with strange love because she's not really present in the narrative in any direct symbolic fashion she's kind of like quiet and that her symbol is kind of combined with another symbol a man 
and, and it's all reproduced as male symbolism, which you know that that that, that goes back to a larger point, uh, really about how you relate male and female stuff in in kind of archetypal symbolism, and how male stuff is typically stood in for the gross kind of the body stuff, and the feminine is left to stand in for the 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 symbolic and the spiritual and the non-gross stuff, but sort of the divine itself is kind of depicted as being feminine. Um, but then, you know, in Christianity, we have kind of this male personage that we think of as God. So it's, you know, it's like this, what originally was a feminine thing, really is a feminine thing, is supposed to be thought of as a feminine thing, gets covered up by a male thing. <laughs> I think that's a commentary on the times, essentially. But, you know, like I said, how Code Talker is kind of this superimposition of a bunch of are parasitologists. That's probably where Strange Love's mostly all of her stuff's happening. And so I think at some point she probably sort of scuttled that Strange Love identity after she was freed from. I think she was probably forced to do a lot of the stuff for uh, Big Boss that she did. I can't imagine her doing qu quite all of the bad stuff uh, that we're told that she does to, to, to Frank Hunter. I think a little bit of it is. Um, so I think the reason she's called Dr. Clark and, and referred to as a man is also part of her cover, but also relates back to what I just said about the whole, you know, male chauvinistic stuff kind of covering up what, what what really is a feminine idea, but also relates to, um, I think after she was done with her strange love bit, she was probably, like I said, sort of held captive under Big Boss, but also maybe didn't even, maybe there was some kind of hypnosis, you know, some kind of like you know, uh, sort of hypnotized by the leader type deal. Maybe even she was compartmentalized within his operation so that she didn't know all the stuff he was doing with the research that he was having her do. But she probably had a pretty good idea. So, anyways, all this stuff is to say that maybe this is also where this mission over the fence is kind of, you know, sort of a wrap-up of Strange Love's uh, storyline too. And let's her move on as Dr. Clark. And, you know, maybe this male person that we rescue here, you can kind of think of as another symbolic Dr. Clark. Also as Dr. Madnar. But also, if that's Dr. Clark, maybe at some point she gets picked up by the American side. And so if what we're seeing here is Solidus literally picking up Madnar, it's also symbolically sort of the American-sided snake, either Skullface, i.e. one of the foxes or somebody else, picking up uh, the new Dr. Strangelove who's... Let's call him Doctor Clark, <laughs> and uh, and say so that's you know that's where he ends up back with um, with Cipher. But then probably what happens after the eighties and after eighty four, especially, especially if, if Chico had been transformed into a giant you know monkey monster, he would probably need a fair amount of help from specifically from paramedic from from her to get back to normal. And so I think that's probably what she was doing in this time period as well. Uh, like the symbolic past time period that's spoken of here in this in this mission, uh, although in ninety if this was in ninety seven, she's probably fully with like the American side of Cipher now, and she's never gonna leave it again because uh, I'll get to it. You know, she's Mei Ling. I think at, at a certain point she you know sort of scrubs her identity again and becomes this young woman Mei Ling, and she's more technologically adept as a symbolic way of saying she's not just some, you know lab coat anymore <laughs> she she understands a little more about other stuff that's not just the symbolic like master of human biology because biology itself is you know through understanding human biology you can come to understand some other systems and stuff like that in nature and stuff like that too so um you know, i think that relates to how Mei Ling is able to make our codec work in metal gear solid one i think it's basically the nano machines are sending out little radar pulses and she's able to you know, sort of uh, pull all that data together and form it into a map. You know, and that's why it looks like it kind of pulses and everything. Um, some notes I want to mention here about Mission 39, just g going back to just adding more stuff about the last time I talked about Over the Fence, because I kind of s sped through it last time because we were just getting into symbolic story interpretation at all. Uh, but... The mission tasks on this mission are kind of interesting to go back and look at. 
you have to steal a jeep. And I think that's really interesting. It's I think it's one of the only missions where. No, there's a couple of others. Close contact. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm glad I thought of this. So stealing the jeep and over the fence here relates to stealing. I think you have to get two jeeps in close contact, and that's also in close contact where you get both the male and the female engineer. So you consider your your bionics expert here kind of maybe a superimposition of both paramedic and Sokolov's kind of expertise in one person, and that's why you're only getting one jeep here. Um. But the only other missions I can think of where you get jeeps are also missions where you deal with kind of Sokolov-related stuff. Um, you also have to get these containers. I think it's a... Is it a red container? Probably relates to more parasite research stuff, though. You also have to get a blueprint, and I can't remember what blueprint it is. Uh, might be the Oregon? Eh, I can't really recall, so I don't want to say... But the, this blueprint also probably relates to other missions where you've had to pick up uh, sort of weapons designers. The the big one off the top of my head is Hellbound. You have to get the uh, the Bambatov blueprint in that one. Also, I didn't say it during that mission. The Bambatov kind of is a weapon that relates to Bambatov, BB, uh, Big Boss. But also really, it's a, it's a way of speaking really of the current Big Boss at that time is the person we're playing as is is young fox actually really uh, and he is big boss we just don't find that out until the end of the game he is big boss because we're going after skullface and only big boss goes after skullface and then snake goes after big boss that's how it works so but that's also gets back into how skullface is kind of a superimposition of both the skullface role and the big boss role and how snake venom snake is kind of a superimposition of both the big boss role and the snake role and how you kind of have to suss that out in different times. And the blueprint here, again, probably relates to, you know, uh, snake stuff. I also want to mention the ruined ceiling that you have to uh, Fulton, your uh, Paris, or the, the bionics expert through, is kind of, I think, an, another cross-reference to, again, Hellbound. If you think back to the... Uh, the place where Huey is held in Hellbound, there's another one of those kind, kind of triangle-shaped bunkers with a ruined ceiling. It's like it's been totally caved in. Looks like something very big has like fallen down from the sky and crashed on the ceiling and, and caved it in. Maybe maybe a bipedal robot. I don't know. Hear me out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Af Afghanistan, so Afghanistan base camp in, in this way is kind of likened to this place. Um, walks in and you know the ruined ceiling in the tower you know it all it all's kind of tied together to me um, also if you consider where this this bionics expert is kept in this building it's it's kind of downstairs in a pit um, you can enter it from ground level on one side but on the other side the only way to enter it is from the upper level and it looks like most of the structure used to be on the upper levels too, but most of the upper level structure is gone now. And that's why there's only this little tower part left, and then this lower underneath part is kind of a pit. And so I think this all implies that you know these, these stories can kind of be superimposed. Maybe there's a, a past version of this story where something fell down out of the sky and crashed through a building and left a hole in the roof. Um... We'll have to talk about it more when we get to mission forty-five, though, because that's the hole in the roof and and you know the building being destroyed and all that stuff. This is this is more symbolism essentially. If you haven't gotten it yet, and uh, it's 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 setting up for stuff that'll get resolved really in, in cloaked in silence, but also relates to what happens in mission forty-six, and those are things that are gonna just have to come later. So that's the end of this lecture. Hope you all have enjoyed. Um, I've got notes for missions 40 through 42 next time. And that one will be a, a decent discussion. And then we'll talk about mission 43. And that is a lot of notes I've got on that. I've got an entire page of notes, and then I've filled in all the margins. It's There's just a lot to talk about mission 43 because there's a lot of tricky stuff that they're doing in that mission. And then the next video after that, we'll talk about mission 44, the, to the total stealth version of Pitch Dark. 
and then talk about a quiet exit. And I've got three pages of notes on a quiet exit, so that's going to be another one of the longer videos. Uh, so we'll have a couple of, sh you know, normal, a couple more of these normal length videos, and then a long video for mission 44 and 45. And then we get to mission 46, which I haven't done the notes for yet, but I know that's going to be the longest one. I'm probably going to have to split that one into two parts because it's just it's an hour long thing for either version of the mission. And really, if you talk about everything, it's it's about an hour and a half worth of material to talk about. So, and I'm gonna I'm gonna take a whole level of you know when I'm anal when I'm analyzing a. a like a film for a, you know an essay or something like that, like I did back in school. This is what I'm going to do to the all the stuff we see in the prologue and in Mission 46, so that we can finally make sense of all that stuff. But hopefully, what I've talked about here makes a little more sense about these missions also for you. And uh, you know, with that said, peace.